Hey everybody, you have David Abrams here on another episode of the Demio Discover Show. I'm really excited to have everyone on. And today we have on Sid, who is an amazing, amazing growth hacker. And I would just say all around superstar online marketer. Uh, he was previously the VP of growth at Thinkific. And if you guys don't know Thinkific, it's an amazing, amazing membership uh, online course platform really similar to kind of Demio in the fact that they focus on simplicity and ease of use and just great user experience. And he has truly transformed their company to help them be a leader in the marketplace. And uh, we often get to work with them and, um, you know, Sid's been a big part of that. So now he's a marketing consultant and working with a ton of great companies, but really his key, you know, genius lies in marketing. So I wanted to bring him on today and learn more of these marketing strategies that he's used with SaaS companies to build them up really in that early startup stage, which is kind of the most crucial period. Um, so we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll talk with Sid here and then, you know, we'll kind of figure out some of the initiatives that he used with Thinkific and then jump into what he's doing now that he sees working in the marketplace. So Sid, thanks so much for joining me, man. David, thank you so much for having me. And, you know, I'm a big fan of Demio. I still remember the first time we, we met online was over a year ago when you and why were showing me the, the demo of, of Demio. And uh, it's amazing to see how far you guys have come. I'm super happy about that. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. Hopefully this is just, um, you know, still early on in the process and we still have a, a ways to go, but I really appreciate that, man. It's, it's been wonderful to see you guys and your, uh, your you know, career path as well. So thanks for coming, man. And we'll jump right into this because I know you have a lot of information. So I guess, you know, give me a rundown in your own words of what you do for companies and how do you even begin to get started in this stuff? How do you get into like growth marketing, growth hacking and stuff like that? Yeah. So what I, I do primarily is, is growth marketing. Um, and that's just basically helping companies who are at a pretty early stage, who have found a good product market fit and who want to just pour fuel on the on the fire and grow faster. And so my role is to come in and to identify how they can grow the the channels they can use, the strategies they can use and get them to to really ramp up uh, and, and get more customers, basically. That's awesome. And how did you get started doing all this? Like, where's the interest come from? Oh, it's a uh, it's it's a crazy journey for me because I I was actually an engineer when I in university I studied engineering I did coding at Yahoo um, and a couple other places and then I got into uh, <laughs> sorry about that that's my Alexa thing going off over there. <laughs> what happened? And you said that your your volume is much better than mine, so maybe I should try to see if I can move my microphone closer. I'm gonna see here, Steve. Is that better? I'm kind of sitting far away from my mic. Anyways, go ahead. I, yeah, I'm using a blue Yeti, by the way. And I'm using so. a blue Snowball. So nice. A little, bit, yeah. a little bit small. That's, that's cool. Um, but yeah, yeah uh, so I started off as an engineer, and then I started to build my own business in South America. And the business was connecting tour operators with tourists because the tour operators and the agencies in South America didn't have websites or online booking portals. So I built that for them. I got them all over there, and I marketed it to tourists. And that's kind of how I got into marketing because I was building this business and trying to market it. And the business in itself didn't really take off, but I started doing more freelance work with other companies. So I started connecting with, you know, companies like uh, Flippa, Crazy Egg. I was doing content marketing for them. Mm. Uh, and then it just, it, you know, a few years passed by. I'm still doing freelance marketing. And then I, I was traveling the world doing that, just doing the digital nomad thing. And I moved back to Canada, which is where, you know, I'm, I'm, I live. My parents live in Winnipeg. And one of my clients, Lemon Stand, was uh, it was in Vancouver, and they were like, "Well, you know, we need someone to come in full time in house and do all of this for, for us." Uh, so I decided to take that job off offering, and then I moved into Thinkific a year later as uh, again the first marketer to help them grow up. So it, this it just comes from like me sort of falling into it, having started my own business and doing a lot of freelance stuff, and then I just got more interested, got better at it, got more experience, worked with a bunch of very popular companies that you all know of. And um, yeah, that's where I am today. That's awesome. I think, you know, each one was probably a stepping stone, kind of learn more and more as you got through each company, bring some strategies. So we'll talk about those. But let's specifically talk about Thinkific right now. Um, what was it like when you joined? What was the MRR at, monthly re recurring revenue? And uh, where are they now after all your efforts and stuff like that? Yeah, um, I'm not sure if I'm at liberty to uh, to give the exact numbers, yeah, but the right. MRR was like very, very low back then. It's uh, almost kind of like, you know, um, negligent, negligible or insignificant. So 
uh, low five, very low five figures. Mm. Now it's, you know, multi-million dollar company, um, you know, mid six figures MRR kind of thing. So uh, it, it's, it's gone from, you know, there to there in less than two years, which is, uh, I'd say, I think it was like a 20, 20 X growth. So 2000% growth in That's two years. Amazing. That's absolutely yeah. amazing. And so, and at the same time, guys, they're also fighting churn and all the other things. So a 20 time or 2000% growth is huge because you're growing over the churn that you have. So it's a really, really powerful growth model there. That's, that's awesome. Two years. It's incredible. Uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a crowded marketplace too. I mean, there's other platforms out there. Um, but okay. So let's talk about what specific things were you doing to get that 2000% growth rate there? Yeah, when I when I first came on, I came on as like a, a growth hackery kind of person and, you know, VP of growth kind of thing. And I was like really the first full time marketer. There were a couple of other people who were doing it part time off the side of the desk. And so like that's, you know, the company was the MRR was very, very low. And so they, they had found product market fit. The existing customers love the uh, product and the CEO is like, well, we just really need to get the word out and more people will, will get the product. Um, and so my job was just to find what are the fastest ways that we can get more people to find out about Thinkific. And some of, so I, I was focusing on quick wins to start with just because I want, because the CEO also wants quick wins. We want to get something going. We want to get MRR coming in the door and then we can hire more people to sort of build out longer term strategies. Right. Mm -hmm. So we started off with some competitor ads, basically ran ads against existing. As you said, there were a lot of existing online course platforms. Thinkific was late to the party in terms of marketing themselves. They, they'd been around for a while with the product, but they, but no one knew about them. So, I, but a lot of people knew about the competitor platform. So what I did was ran ads against them and said, Hey, you're checking them out. Come check us out, out, out as well. And I gave them three reasons why on the landing page converted those people. That's one thing. Did, Second can I thing was, just, can, I, can I ask there? Yeah. Did you do specific landing pages for each competitor with unique yeah. comparisons? Specific ad ad set ad um, ad campaigns for each competitor with a specific landing page. Like the ta the entire funnel from start to finish was tailor made for each competitor, and we did multiple competitors. Um, awesome. And that way, I could I could very very easily control my ad spend and the 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 dollars per like the cost per clicks and cost per leads and cost per customers. And so we were getting it for like dirt cheap, as opposed to if we had simply done simply advertise for online course platform, which we did eventually. Mm -hmm. But to start off with, we had limited budgets, limited time. Um, and so, yeah. That's awesome. That's what's so great about you. Strategic, low budget things to start in that area is what you have to do. So it's a lot of creative thinking there. Exactly. Yeah. You want to kind of find, is, and we, we can probably talk about this a bit more later, but just the what I do is find like the best ROI, the highest ROI channels for your business when you're starting out mm -hmm. and then, you know, put the put pressure on that, get the money in, and then we can expand to more channels. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so that's what I did. It, it was finding, found that channel. The next was uh, partnerships. Uh, we, we started connecting with other companies that shared our audience. So email marketing softwares like ConvertKit, um, you know, you, we have done partnerships, Demi and Thinkific, because a lot of people use webinars, landing page softwares, um, that kind of stuff. And just doing, you know, webinar swaps, uh, email swaps, coupon swaps, um, you know, uh, lead magnet swaps. So just like you share us, we'll share you that kind of thing that got us like a, a lot of growth, a lot of new leads. And then influencers, influencers were, and, and I think like our biggest sort of channel, if you look at aggregate over the last two years, uh, basically just connecting with people who are in the, in the online course industry who are, you know, uh, talking about how to create online courses or how to grow your business online. And these people have large followings. And so we go to them and say, Hey, let's, let's do something together. Let's partner up. And they end up promoting us to their audience. Awesome. So you gave a lot of great stuff. So I just want to kind of break the down a little bit more when, when you're first starting and you're looking at this and you, you come into a company and it sounds like you have all these different channels that you can take, or you're trying to be specific. How do you prioritize like what order they go into or, you know, when do you do a webinar swap versus an email swap or you just say, hey, let's go influencers first. Like, how are you kind of breaking that down to figure out what strategy is the most important? Because you only have so much time in your day. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, hit the nail on the head there with the, the problem that any startup faces is they have limited resources, limited time, limited manpower, limited people, um, limited budget. And so you have to find the channels or the strategies that 
cost you the lowest amount of time, money, people, mm-hmm. but get you, get you the largest return back. And so what we do, what we did was I start off with a brainstorm, brainstorming session with the entire company, not just the marketers. Uh, well, there weren't any marketers back then, but like people in support, people in product. And so I'm getting all this information back from people who aren't necessarily in marketing, but they're customer facing as well. Mm-hmm. Put all the ideas on a board and then start ranking them based on my experiences on of these channels, uh, based on my estimation of how much it's going to take given our current resources, resources to invest in that strategy or channel and my expectations of return. And then I do an ROI calculation and I find the top ROI one and then we hit that. Wow, that's awesome. And I don't want to steal your, your secret sauce there, but what are you doing to get an ROI calculation? Is that just, again, your kind of your secret sauce that you've already put together? It's there's no secret sauce. It's I mean, this is where you need to be a marketer and you need to have experience, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because like the, the 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 system is easy. It's basically making an assumption about how much time, money or people you invest in mm-hmm. and an assumption about how much money you'll get back in terms of new customers. Right. And so the assumptions are more accurate, the more experience you have in marketing because you've done this stuff before. Mm-hmm. Right. Otherwise, I'm just pulling numbers out of the air. Right. So while, you know, these and I'm not saying mine were completely 100 percent accurate. Obviously, there are some, you know, it's it's inaccurate to some level. And so I I, I tag on a, um, a confidence value as well. So I say the ROI is this, but I'm 80 percent confident. So therefore, I multiplied by 0.8 to to uh, to reduce the the expected ROI versus the ROI of this is could be this and I'm 100% confident, mm-hmm. right? So I'm more confident of an ad because I know exact the exact numbers. I know a cost per click is, let's say a dollar and I know the conversion rate is 10%. Therefore, you know, I'm getting it for $10 a lead and each lead is worth this much. So I know exactly my numbers and I can say with 100% confident, that's the ROI. But with, you know, uh, with content, I don't know the numbers exactly. And so I have like 50% confidence. And so that ROI may be higher, but tagging on the 50% confidence rate would bring it down a little more. That's incredible. I think that's your engineering mind there, putting the tail of that yeah. equation, but that's really awesome. I love that uh, that confidence level that kind of dictates how much you really rely on it. And and so when you're doing these things, I think this you said something that was really important, so I kind of want to harp back on it. You said you sat down not just with like the marketing team, you sat down with everybody, anyone customer facing. So when you're doing these marketing initiatives, are you really trying to keep your hands in all the different like areas from, um, you know, product team to, uh, you know, like the leadership team, are you trying to just keep communication and just learn as much as you can and relay that back so that the product also, you know, mimics what people are saying in marketing or like, how are you doing that? Or is just folk, you're just trying to keep your eyes focused on marketing. Well, primarily my role initially, like when the company was small, then yeah, I was in, in all those aspects, but as the company grows, um, it's harder for me to be involved in everything. I, I was, I'm on the leadership team where I was on the leadership team when I was in the company. Um, but we had like, we had a very competent, uh, CTO, uh, CEOs, head of customer support. And so we'd have leadership meetings every week where we discuss things. Uh, and we, we had a mandate to each one of us who were in the leadership team to go out, speak to a customer or a client or, or someone internally and get some ideas and, and filter it upwards. So, but in, in, but you know, my focus mainly was to get ideas from these people because the customer, customer support people are talking to customers and customers are giving them feedback in terms of, you know, Hey, here's how I found you. Um, here's, uh, you know, here are some ideas, uh, here are some features that I need. Here's what I'm doing, you know? And so we're getting information about that customer persona, which I can then use and, and go, all right. So most of our customers seem to be, uh, uh, they, they seem to be coaches. Uh, therefore, the, you know, here are the problems that coaches face. They also seem to be heavily active on Facebook. Therefore, Facebook seems to be a good channel, should be a good channel for us to focus on that kind of thing. Got it. And I think one of the things that we're really kind of in the process of learning more about, I think at any company is, and this is really related to product market fit, is when you start getting customers coming in through your marketing channels, how are you then filtering out which customers and which customer types are the right customers for your business. And those are the ones you want to dial in on more because like every customer isn't the perfect customer. Some are higher churning than others. Some are higher usage than others. Like how are you guys going back afterwards and saying, okay, not just what dollar amounts are brought in, but what was like, what is the best customer that we have coming in? I know that's kind of complicated, but kind of an important thing. 
It is important and it is, you need to set up the, the analytics and tracking in advance so that you can start collecting data about this. And we had done that fortunately. So we knew when you sign up for Thinkific, there are a series of questions like through the onboarding steps that you go through that ask you, what is your primary reason for creating an online course? Um, what have you created courses before that kind of thing? And uh, what is your goal? Right? So we're collecting information about the customers. So we know that some people are just messing around and just checking it out versus some people already have a course and they've, they've created on a different platform and they're not happy with the pl platform and they're moving over. So now we have data about these different levels and we can see an aggregate of, okay, this level seems to be, uh, you know, have, a, you know, one tenth the churn that this level does, right? We also collected other statistics like, well, we, you know, are they using a custom domain name when they sign up? like with their email. So is it a Gmail, Yahoo, Hotmail account versus, you know, uh, David Demio.com kind of account, right? So those custom domain names we know are, you know, nine times more likely to, to end up as a paying customer versus a Yahoo Hotmail account, right? So again, so we know that uh, those, we have basically set it up in advance so that we can collect that. So you're basically saying if someone was, had a company already, they were yeah. much better of a customer. Than us. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. I'm saying uh, if they if they've already got a business, they have a company, they have uh, yeah dogs. I love them. Uh, they they are more likely to succeed because you know they have rec revenue coming in, they've got something going, and so. Versus someone who's not, who doesn't have a company, doesn't have any idea of what kind of course they want to create uh, coming on. And I, you know, that'll be the same, same thing for you at Demio, right? Uh, you, Demio is, as a webinar tool is, is good for companies that want to convert their leads into customers. Uh, and this could be individuals who have their own online course business or big companies, companies like Thinkific or even larger companies. So I would, I would, um, Surmise that if you looked at your data and you said, all right, you split it into custom domains versus Gmail Yahoo accounts, you'd see that the custom domains are probably doing more webinars or higher volume webinars or whatever, right? Totally. Uh, you're absolutely right. A hundred percent. I think that's just- you're, you're muted right now, David. How about now? Yeah, you're good. Okay. No, I was yeah. turning my mic back on. I had a, the dogs were creating their own fight over there. Um, but yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I think- um, you know, I think there's a lot of different ways to chop the data, like to really learn about yeah. what customers are right. I just think it's a really important thing if we're talking about marketing and we're talking about launching either a SaaS or startup or whatever it is, that you understand that marketing is bringing in customers, but it's also dialing in on bringing in the right customers and doing it smart. So so let's say this, you're, you're out here now, you're talking to a lot of these early stage customers and, pro, um, and softwares and stuff, what advice would you give people that are kind of in that phase, in that startup phase, they're ready to start looking at growth expansion, growth hacking. You know, you, you mentioned a bunch of different strategies, but uh, what would you say would be your solid, like just advice as far as if you're here, here's where I would take, here's what I would probably do. Yeah. So, and this is actually, uh, uh, I, I've, I've been trying to do like a unified concept of, of growth marketing for early stage startups based on all my experiences and talking to other marketers and, you know, freelancing with contracting with other companies is I've mentioned a few of these pieces, but it's, I, I feel like it's a five step process and it starts with the customer persona, which is understanding the customer, right? Exactly. Who are the people that are going to most want or need your platform benefit from your platform or service or product, whatever it is, right? Dialing down on that customer persona. And when I say persona, it means like, you know, where, where do they hang out online? What, what books do they read? What uh, blogs do they follow? What newsletters do they sign up to? Um, you know, what social networks are they most active on? That kind of stuff. So now you know where they are. However, the, the other piece that most people forget is what, where, what stage of the customer journey are they at? Right. Cause now, cause some customers are at a much earlier stage than others. Some are ready to buy instantly. Some are like still sort of, you know, just unaware of the problem that they have that your, your uh, software, your app solves for them. Right. So mapping out the customer journey and, and, and saying, all right. So for this customer persona, and you may have multiple personas, but you do it one persona at a time and you go problem unaware, problem aware, solution aware, um, product aware, and then decision point. Right. And then after that, there's retention. And 
follow this customer and this is going to require maybe you stepping in a customer's shoes uh you know as someone who's creating a, a product in an industry you probably already have some industry experience so you may already know a few things but it may also require you reaching out to customers surveying them right um, i'm going to repeat the stages again for steve it's problem unaware problem aware solution aware product aware and decision so let me just explain what that means so um for let's say let's let's go with thinkific right Thinkific is an online course platform. It's for people who want to create a course and sell it online, and it makes it easy for them to use. So it solves a problem of being able to set up a website, have students, manage students, create courses, do a checkout, all of that stuff, right? Uh, basic, basically solve the technology of creating a course online and selling it online. Now, our ideal custo customers, as we've seen, are people who are coaches, speakers, authors, people who have content, training content, who are who are sort of distributing that knowledge in other avenues. So a coach is someone who would coach you one on one and he's training you and educating you, but it's done as a one on one thing. An author is someone who's training and educating you through a book. A speaker is training, educating you through stage. But these these the problem there is they can't scale it up. Right. As a coach, I can only do at least, uh, you know, at most maybe 24 one on ones in a day. Right. Uh, one hour one on ones. So I have a limit to how many people I can train. Whereas with an online course, I create the course once and then I can train millions of thousands of people around the world. So my, I can scale up with an online course. So as a coach, if I'm, if I'm a coach and I'm happy with just doing one on one, I'm unaware of the problem I have. And the problem I have is that I cannot scale my business, right? At some point, I'm going to become aware of that problem and go, shit, I'm getting, sorry about that. Did I, am I not allowed, am I allowed to say that? Okay. <laughs> At some point, I'm going to realize that I have too many clients and I can't scale up and I'm getting burnt out. I am now problem aware. I need to scale, I need to scale up, right? Then I'm like, all right, so what do I do? How do I solve this problem that I can't scale up because I'm doing one-on-ones? And I start researching and I, and I come across ideas like, I should write a book. I should speak on stage. I should create an online course. Now I am solution aware. I have multiple solutions to go down, right? Let's say I decide, all right, let's create an online course. How do I create an online course? What software do I use to do this? And I go research and now I find Thinkific and I find all the other, other platforms. Now I'm product aware, right? And then it's time for me to choose one of these products, make a decision, pick, let's say Thinkific and create my course with it. Now I've made the decision. And then finally, retention is just staying with that product and using it over and over again, right? And I can do this for Demio. I can do this for any other business. Um, and so, stage. So, so that's basically part. The second part of this process that I'm explaining is you first understand the customer, and then you understand the customer journey. And what are the triggers for them to move from one stage to the other in this journey? What are the channel or touch points that you need to get them to pull them all the way through the journey, right? So now that you've got that journey and you've got all the channels and touch points, you have a whole list of channels and touch points. Now you can do the ROI prioritization thing that I was talking about earlier, where you say, all right, this seems to be the best one versus this versus this versus this. And then, you know, depending on how many resources you have, you'll, you'll work on one channel or two channels or three channels, uh, whatever, right? Then now, because I also mentioned that we are making assumptions about the ROI of these channels, you want to run a few tests first. You don't want to go all in and realize that your assumptions were wrong. So part, part four of this whole process, right? Part one was persona, part two was customer journey, part three was prioritization, part four is testing. Testing your assumptions, doing like really quick one week tests, very low budget, low, uh, low time investment, test multiple ideas and then go, all right, looks like this was closest to our assumption. This seems to be the highest ROI channel. Let's double down on it. So you double down on it. And then part five is, all right, now that you're doubling down on it, how do you scale that channel up? You either automate it using certain tools. So webinars, I can automate it with Demio, the whole process, and then I can step out and do something else. Uh, you hire for it, so you bring in someone full-time or you just outsource for it uh, for that particular channel. So that's kind of like the whole step-by-step -step thing plan that you'd go through and that sort of like I could work uh, work with a company to do that. That's absolutely amazing. That was really, really uh, well said and really well thought out. And I think a lot of people on the marketing side, especially don't focus on that avatar first or the, the customer journey, the five phases of the customer jersey, journey, Jersey, Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of times that causes you to start doing marketing 
in the wrong places to the wrong person, bringing in the wrong customer, and then you're trying to reverse engineer all of it. So I think it's really, really smart that you're doing it in this way. Uh, Jay wants you to wants to know if you can repeat those five one more time. Yeah. So number one, understand your cus customer. So your customer persona, understand exactly what their problems are, who these people are, where they hang out online. That's number one. Number two is the journey, customer journey, going from problem unaware all the way to decision point, right? And at any given time in, you know, in, your, in the universe, there are some people in, in the problem unaware stage, there are some people in the problem where, and there's, there are people all over the journey map. But understanding that journey map and what takes them from one stage to the other is key, right? Number three is once you've identified the journey map and what trigger points, you, you pull out all the trigger points, list them out, and then you do a prioritization of them based on your assumptions about these channels and what the ROI could be, right? And then you, number four is you test and make sure that your assumptions are correct about these channels and identify the best channel to be going all in on, right? And then number five is go all in on the channel that works. Of course, if the channels don't work, you go through the next one and you try again. But number five is going all in on the channel that works and that's either automating it or outsourcing it or hiring someone to do it for you before you move on to the next set of channels. That's awesome. And I did just type it out as Steve asked. So you guys have Excellent. that in the chat, um, but those are fantastic. Sorry, Lucas, I beat you. Um, so awesome. So you're taking this framework and you're going to uh, some new companies now. You're, you, you've left Thinkific at this point. Um, what things are you starting to focus on now? Are you still going to be in the same uh, early stage startup? Is that what you're kind of looking at now? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I've got like a dozen past clients and companies that I've worked for that are all SaaS companies, early stage SaaS. So that's kind of like my forte now. Um, and I'm just going to focus on it. Yeah. Um, I also, I've also done like, you've probably seen the numbers, but I've done like hundreds of webinars over the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, before we, before we switch to demo, demo, we're using another platform. Um, so I'm doing webinars on that and then on demo. So there's like, I'm, I'm thinking of like creating maybe courses for, uh, other people on how to, you know, how to use demo or, and how to run webinars for SaaS businesses specifically. Um, I would do it for like coaches and stuff, but there are a lot of people and you've already like, you know, you've, you've connected with people like Joel and how stuff are doing it. So they don't want to step on the issues. Uh, and I, I still think that a lot of SaaS companies could use webinars as a really good growth channel. I think talking about the framework that you just mentioned and then yeah. how you can not only how to build the webinar, but I think one of the things I'm going to ask you about now is like the webinar swaps that you set up in SaaS. Like, so you create the webinar, you're basing it on your, 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 um, customer persona, where they are in the customer journey. You looked at your trigger points, like webinars would be one of the best things that we can do right now. So you're focusing mm -hmm. on doing some testing with webinars. How are you getting people in to, to do webinars with? Where are you finding those strategic partners? How are you lining those things up? And if you did a course, by the way, they, people would love to learn that part of it too. But yeah. we'll talk about it right now. Sure. Yeah. So again, you know, um, understanding the, the customer persona, the, and who are the, and part of that persona I mentioned earlier was who do they follow online? So now we know who are the influencers. We know that people like um, Lewis House or John Lee Dumas are sort of like top influencers in this space. And Lewis House and John Lee Dumas don't specifically talk about creating online courses, but they do talk about online business and scaling up online. So they're, they're playing in the solution aware stage. So people who are on their email list are kind of solution aware, but they don't know yet about the product. So we pitch them with a, a webinar that is specific to solution aware people, which is, you know, hey, um, here's how to, the blueprint to creating an online course. So the webinar is not even about Thinkific mm -hmm. because they aren't at the stage where they're, you know, uh, comparing products. They're still at the stage where they're trying to decide if online courses are for them, right? So we're going to Lewis and we're going to Johnny Dumas. We're going to all these other influencers who are big names in the online marketing space and online business and make money online space. And we're going, hey, online courses is one way you can make money online. Come and understand why you need to use them and how to create an online course, a complete blueprint to online courses. That's the webinar we pitch them. Um, and then we present that webinar to all these people. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a really great framework. And again, guys, it all goes back to the early stage items. That's why the early stage of research is so critical in this framework to have it all work together. But you know, let's, let's take a step back from that. I think you've done an amazing job of explaining this stuff. Um, you know, I want to ask, you know, marketing is often experimental. Like you said, you're 
got a confidence score. You're not sure how things are going to go, if they're going to go well. When sometimes that are like, give me an example of a time where you went uh, pretty hard on a marketing initiative and maybe it failed, but you learned something good from it. I mean, what's one story that you got a good lesson out of it? Oh man, I've got stories about that. <laughs> yeah, I made mistakes. And I, you know, the mistakes are where you learn the most. Um, so I'm actually glad that I made those mistakes. But a uh, couple of, uh, do you want, how many stories do you want? Just one or should as I go more? As many as you want. That's all good lessons. Um, there was, yeah, so there's one, one story where we created, so we went to a big conference down in, uh, was it Vegas, I think? And yeah, there were the the speaker list was amazing. Like some of the best, biggest influencers. We hadn't yet reached out to these people. And we're like, what can we do to really get their attention? Right. Mm -hmm. So we went there as sponsors. So now we've got like some sort of status in that uh, conference. And then we made a deal with the with the conference organizers that we would want to interview all the speakers for just like five minutes after they're done speaking, right? Backstage when they come off stage. We have a guy with a camera, we have an interviewer. And we compile all these interviews into an online course, which we call Passion to Profit. So it's just a generic online course on how to convert your passion into profits. Again, not specifically about online courses, but you know, obviously we introduce the concept of online courses there, and then we bring them, we talk about Thinkific. So the idea was simply, all right, this by doing this and by putting it all together in a course, you know, not only do we get people in interest in online courses and Thinkific, but we are now connecting with these influencers and maybe they'll share the course out, whatever else. We even connected with a nonprofit organization and we said we'll donate all profits of people who bought this course to that charity. Mm -hmm. So we weren't making money from it, but it was just the whole point was to connect with influencers, the speakers, and then get, get, a, get a foot in the door with them and get them to, you know, take the first little step of sharing this course out. And then maybe we can talk about further campaigns where we do webinar swaps with them, right? Mm -hmm. But what happened was, and you know, this was my bad as sort of like a manager at that point, we had more people, a bigger team, uh, I'd say almost like 10 people on the team. And I was trying to juggle multiple things. I was trying to juggle um, this, but also ads. So we were ramping up ads at the same time. We were uh, doing a lot of content. We were uh, still doing existing partner webinars. We were building a new affiliate channel, all of this stuff. And so, and, 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 the scope of the project got out of hand. We spent, we, we had a date. We wanted to com complete the course in a month and then uh, reach out to all the people, the speakers that we interviewed and get them to share it. But a month passed by and uh, we were still working on the videos, trying to make it look nice. Month two, end of month, almost like month three, we, we were like, all right, it's now ready. But then we hadn't kept in touch with all these speakers. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, at the end of it, it was like, well, now we've got this asset but you know we've got to still we've got to build that relationship up again now because it was long it was a long time ago mm -hmm. uh so you know just my biggest learning there was a focusing right just making sure that you've got the right focuses and uh i just i was like new people on the team let's do more stuff right and i just got uh, out of my head a bit too much over there and then b was um even like within a project focusing within the project making sure it stays within scope hitting those deadlines and being disciplined about that that's an amazing lesson. I think almost every call we hear focus as one of the key lessons. And it's something that I would just hammer on on every one of these calls. Yeah. Be focused yeah. in marketing and your business and your product fit, everything. But, but that's awesome. Any other stories you want to share? Um, yeah, I think that, that was like the, the big one. There were a few more smaller ones, but we can come back to it if you have more time. How'd that course do once you got it out there? Did it bring in any leads or did it really get any momentum? It, it, it got a little bit, we've got a couple of people to share it. We shared it out. Um, but you know, it wasn't as big of a bang as we had initially thought it would be. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, in the end, I, I would say, and we, before we create a project, we set goals, right? So we know when we measure up at the end, this is how much it did versus what we had set. So, you know, in the end, according to our goal, it, it didn't hit the goal. So it was a failure. Understood. Understood. But it still sounds yeah. like you learned a lot. Maybe you connected with some of those people and hopefully got a webinar swap out of one of them. Yeah, exactly. And the, so the process was at the end of it, I was like, look, let's not focus on pushing this course out um, because now that's a separate product that we need to market aside from Thinkific. Yeah. And it's not easy to market. Like it does take time to market a course. I can't just, it's not like tweeting it out every now and then. Um, so I said, let's, let's focus on now that we have the course out, let's focus on rebuilding those relationships with the speakers and getting those webinars in. 
And so that's what it changed to. So we did get a few webinars. We're still working on relationships with the others and we're booking that in. That's awesome. That's the long-term thinking that uh, really wins in the end too. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, listen, before we jump over to the quick fire, uh, discover questions, which I absolutely love. I always get so much gold in these questions. I want to ask this, and you've been doing this for, for a few years now. You've been working really, really hard in these companies, growing them amazingly fast and just really well. What's your why? What gets you out of bed every day like to just keep driving you know, and driving the growth at Fallon? The, the, I think the ultimate why is just like I'm fascinated by technology and and some of the, the more frontier sciences that we have. And just like there there are there's so many brilliant and smart people building amazing products like you guys at Demio and like so many other people and just making sure that those products see the grow as grow to their potential. That's kind of like what excites me because then more people are able to build their businesses and technology grows faster. And um, yeah, it's just like, it's, it's one big sort of like thing for me to just be able to help people grow those businesses. And for me to also grow myself as a person, as a marketer, for me to earn a revenue from helping other companies grow businesses that I can then funnel into investing in companies again mm -hmm. as another way of helping them. So investing in startups, investing in um, new technologies like, uh, uh, longevity, right? Age, uh, fighting, or uh, immortality, longevity, space travel, that kind of stuff. Um, all the new frontier science technology. So it's all, it's all interconnected for me in, in some weird way. <laughs> no, that's awesome. And it really, again, it sounds so much like I just see so much of your engineering personality come out, like solving, you like to solve problems. You want to solve yeah. the challenge. You want to help the growth. And I think you kind of see it as an equation almost, which is, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, but cool, let's jump over to the quick fire discover questions. I won't take too much more of your time here today. All right, here, are you ready to go? We're gonna go through these questions and just really answer the first thought or first you know, thoughts that come into your head as far as uh, recommendations and stuff like that. No, no need to deeply think about these, but how much do you read during the week? About three books. A week? Yeah, two to, three, two to three books a week, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And what's your top book recommendation right now? The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz. It's a great book. Amazing. So, book. Good. And, so good. And he loves some good rap music in there as well. Yeah. What would you tell your younger self starting a business today? Uh, I'd say focus on the one thing that's going to bring you the biggest impact. One thing, focus. Focus, and one focus thing. on the one thing. What's one characteristic you've had to discover on your own journey that makes you a better and stronger entrepreneur? Being disciplined, like, and not just in your business, but in your, in the rest of your life as well. Just being disciplined about what you do during the day, um, you know, where you spend your time, where you spend your effort and, uh, yeah, not trying to, not getting distracted by other shiny objects. Smart. Very good advice. And what's an advice you would give someone just starting an online business or possibly a SaaS or startup? Again, understand the, understand the customer focus on, what it is that you deliver and the best way to get that to that customer focus. Don't try to do too many things at once. Just focus on like maybe one channel or two channels. If, if you have the capacity for it. I totally agree. I think one channel is a really good advice. If you're just starting, especially if you're on just your start. own, there's just a lot to do. Um, now what's one thing you're most looking forward to in technology. You kind of talked about it a second ago, but what's something that you're really excited about? Well, actually right now I'm all, I'm highly excited about cryptocurrencies and uh, I've been sort of just, uh, uh, I've put aside some money to go and invest and play with that stuff. But in, in, I, I also just read a book called Tomorrowland, uh, by Stephen Kotler. And it, he talks about, uh, bionics and how we were coming up with like robotic arms and limbs and, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, you know, organs. Uh, he talks about immortality, longevity, basically. Uh, and then, um, he talks about AI and, and downloading your brain and, uh, other putting it into another conscious. So that's, that's like the fringe science uh, that, that fascinates me. I love that stuff too. It really is interesting. And, and it's also scary at the same time. We don't know where we're going yet, but um, it's going to be interesting as we build into that stuff. Yeah. But, uh, well, well, awesome. Sid, thank you so much for, for joining us today. I just want to stop real fast before we wrap up. Does anybody here that's live have any questions for Sid, maybe about his framework or any of the different marketing strategies that he's done? Uh, just pop them in chat. We can you know, ask him here live uh, and, and go through them. Uh, Steve, who were the online marketers you said uh, earlier? I think it was Lewis Howes and John Lee Dumas. Yep. 
I'll type it out for just Lewis Howes and John Lee Dumas. Both amazing, amazing guys. I think that's how you spell his last name, Dumas. Um, yeah, and I, and there are way more. Like, you know, many of the people that you've uh, interviewed here and Demio Discover as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's a lot of great, great influences out there. And I think, Steve, really, you just want to do the research in your space and what your product would serve for them. Um, just kind of like Sid was talking about earlier. But cool. Does anyone else have any last questions? Any final thoughts for Sid before we wrap up? <laughs> yes. yes, you can, Jay. You guys can have my email address. Um, I'm in Canada, so I'm and I'm on the on the west west coast, um, Vancouver. But you can have my email address, and then you can contact me anytime. Happy to help. Awesome. And awesome. my website is also just sidbarat.com. I, uh, unlike every other market, I don't have like an email sign up on that site. But now that I'm out on my own, I'm gonna just be building up, like creating more content about this process that I have. Um, and the things that I learned from various other companies and my interviews with other uh, companies and putting it out there. So I'll be on medium.com just sharing all my information and knowledge. So that is awesome. We'll definitely be big followers here. We've learned a lot. We've been on calls with uh, Sid before and we've learned a lot here at Demi ourselves. And it's a real honor to have you on this call. So I appreciate you taking some time to meet with us today. Thank you so much, David. This was awesome. I loved it. Awesome. All right, guys. Everyone have a great day and we'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. See ya.